Hey everybody, and Tony here with a review of Verdi's Un Ballo en Mascara, which was shown last night at the Deutsche Oper Berlin. The conductor was Donald Renickles, the production was done by the late, great Götz Friedrich, the set design and costumes were done by Gottfried Pilz and Isabel Ines Glatar, the assistant director was Gerlinda Pelkowski, and the chorus master was Raymond Hughes. Now for those of you who have watched my review of yet another production of Ballo en Mascara at the Arena de Verona, this opera was based on the assassination of the Swedish king Gustavus III in 1792 as accomplished by Counts René Ankerström, Ribbing, and Horn. This assassination via conspiracies was the spark of the play Le Bal Masqué, or in English, A Masked Ball, by the French playwright Eugène Scribé, which in turn had its first operatic adaptation in 1833 through the French composer Daniel François Esprit Aubé, until in 1857, Giuseppe Verdi took the original source material and made his own operatic adaptation, initially titled Gustavo il Terzo. Now, during this opera's premiere, this was met with a lot of controversy via the Neapolitan audience who demanded for censorship. It wasn't until 1859 that Verdi transported the action of what happened in 1792 Sweden all the way up to taking the action in the 18th century Boston, replacing King Gustavus III with a British governor in the form of Count Ricardo of Warwick. Yes, there were also some other changes, like instead of having the likes of Cristiano, Conte Ribbing, and Conte Horn, they were changed to Silvano, Samuele, and Tommaso. Yes, the names of Renato, Amelia, and Oscar, and even Ulrica were still maintained, but the setting was entirely changed. With that said, both the Swedish and the Boston versions have been performed internationally, and each of these versions have gained their great amounts of success. And last night, I saw the Swedish version, and I was looking forward to this particular production because of the cast consisting of Adrian Pejanka, Jorge de Leon, Etienne Dupuy, Judith Katashi, and Elena Zalagova singing the main roles. I'll get to them later, but first, the production. Overall, the production was kind of stark, and it didn't really have a lot of scenery added into it, though it had some great lighting added into the mix. I really loved how the opera started with King Gustavo and Oscar basically playing with each other and having a lot of fun with each other, and you could definitely see the relationship established between the two. Not only is Gustavo the master and Oscar being the paid servant boy, but you can definitely see a firm friendship being built by these two based on trust and based on fate, especially when it comes to the both of them putting on their masks and their dresses and you could definitely see that there is some great amounts of foreshadowing in this opera. Masks and costumes are even a great motif being used in this production which is no surprise as the title of this opera is Un Ballo en Mascara. So you could definitely see all these masks come into play to signify that there are secrets lurking within these characters and destinies that these characters cannot avoid. And I really love the costumes as well. The costume that really stood out to me the most was Ulrika's costume, as she had a great amount of face paint, had long hair, and had a gorgeous leather silken robe, and she looked like a goddess. It's to symbolize that not only is Ulrika some fortune teller, but she is a high priestess of the god of the underworld, and she is his main messenger. And she'll definitely make sure that she delivers those said messages and does so in a way that makes her not evil nor particularly good, 
but somewhere along the neutral line, but manages to really get two and two together when it comes to the characters' fates. Color is used really significantly here, especially in the ball scene, where we have the three main colors of black, white, and red being used on the gowns. In my interpretation, black is meant to symbolize death, white is meant to signify life and innocence, and red is meant to signify blood, as to see that these colors play a very significant role in what happens throughout the opera. We have a tale of betrayal, friendship, and love, and passion really seething the plot and making it thicker and thicker until the climax of this opera. So there were a lot of interesting ideas and there was a lot of really great costumes to be found and the lighting was very well done. However, I would have loved to have a little bit more scenery, like have some trees in Orika's hideout, maybe have some statues, and maybe just have a little bit more scenery in general. But as it is, it's still very decent. The costumes and the makeup really stood out, especially when it came to the ball scene, which really had that feeling of intrigue mixed with pleasure, and you could definitely see that come into play, especially in the climax. And now we get to the singers, starting off with Jorge de Leon as Gustavo Irterzo, the main hero of this opera. I've heard a lot of amazing things about this tenor, saying that he's been very wonderful in the Spinto tenor repertoire. And I even glanced at his biography, and it states that he sang roles like Cavaradossi, Radames, and all of the big Italian spinto tenor roles. And I can safely say that all of these wonderful things about Señor de Leon are all confirmed true. He has a voice of richness, beauty, and power that he manages to combine in one great package. And just by listening to his voice, I hear remnants of Placido Domingo in his prime combined with the lyricism of Marcelo Alvarez combined into one excellent package. However, there was a caveat to his vocal performance as his diction in the first act was quite muddled but his efforts got a lot better in the much later acts where his diction really improved. His stage presence was absolutely involving. He was a figure of power, sympathy, and just a great sense of nobility to really add to this character. He really knew how to manipulate not only his voice, but his dramatic resources to make this character come alive, and he was an absolute pro in this role. He gave it 110%, despite the muddled diction in the first act. But as I said before, he got a lot better in the much later acts, and he really gave a very moving portrayal of Masse Forze, in terms of his interpretation of the Tu Se Fedele, he sang it with clarion power and at the same time combined lyricism with power and beauty, making for such an awesome performance. Seeing the role of Conte Renato Ankarström was the superb cavalier baritone Etienne Dupuy. Now, while I love his singing and his acting really making this character very complex and very interesting in his own right and finding a lot of subtleties, I am reminded of all the great baritones of the past who have even attempted this role. The likes of Tito Gobbi, Anselmo Colzani, Robert Merrill, Leonard Warren, Cheryl Mills, Mario Tanassi, Renato Brusson, and even the likes of Silvano Caroli, and a lot of the great Italian baritones of the past, lest I forget the likes of Matteo Manugera and Piero Capuccilli. 
these baritones have excelled in their own special ways in this particular role and have gained a lot of critical success. In terms of Etienne Dupuy, as I stated before, he has a very fine voice. I heard him many times as Giorgio Gemeau in La Traviata, Enrico from Lucia de la Marmore, and a lot of other roles. And he has a very bright future ahead of him in terms of the Cavalier Baritone repertoire. However, I am constantly reminded of those bigger, more biting voices, which he kind of lacked, but he compensated all of that in terms of his fine singing and musicianship and his very involving acting. He has a bright future ahead of him, so I'm sure that within five to ten years' time, he will definitely be a lot better than he was. Singing the Ulrika was Judith Kutasi, who I also saw two months ago as the third lady from Magic Flute. Now, while she has a very firm and steady and sturdy stage presence, complete with a great sense of authority and beauty, and she looked absolutely fabulous in that costume, making her look so heavenly, she kind of lacks in terms of voice. That's not to say she is a bad singer. In fact, she was a very decent musician. She has a very fine voice. She has a very nice color to her voice, which combines light and dark in one fine package. It's just that I'm reminded of all the great contraltos of the past who have specialized as Ulrika. Voices like Res Fischer, Elvira Casazza, Karin Brantzel, Marian Anderson, Elisabeth Höngen, Margareta Klose, Ina Gerhain, Maureen Forrester, Jean Madeira, Christa Ludwig, Shirley Verrett, Grace Bumbry, Ortrud Wenkel, Hannah Schwartz, Eva Podler, Jane Henschel, and even Meta Ising and Jadwiga Rappé, and a lot of other great dramatic and true contraltos who have sung Ulrika. Now, if you've seen my previous videos, it's hinted that I have a very high expectation for any ideal Ulrika. I want a great Ulrika. I want a great sounding contralto. I want a true, deep, dark, cavernous contralto. And yes, there have been some wide-ranging and very versatile dramatic mezzos a la Elena Nicolai, Evestignani, and Giulietta Signonato, and even my personal favorite contralto, Fedora Barbieri, who have specialized as Ulrika. And they were absolutely fabulous. With Judith Katassi, while she is a decent musician, I just have to say that she is still too young to portray this iconic character. She really needs a lot more time to develop, and maybe if you give her five to ten years, maybe she will definitely be a lot better than how she was at this point. But as she was, she was good. I have high expectations for any Ulrika as I want her to be great, if not excellent. She was good. She was quite decent, and she does have a very promising future ahead of her. But for now, Ulrika is not really for her right now. I expect a more mature singer, even though she herself was a decent musician. It's just that I need someone a lot more mature and fuller sounding. Then we get the treat of having Adrian Pejanka as Amelia, and she was absolutely moving in this particular role, which she has been singing for many years. She has one of the finest instruments ever, and she has a very sturdy and noble stage presence. However, I seem to notice that there were moments where she thinned out in the higher registers specifically her high C's, but I still have to give her loads of credit for being totally involved in the drama and for making this character come alive with her sturdy and noble stage presence and her very fine voice despite some reservations in the higher register. 
he was still a very involving performer. Then we get Oscar, sung by the superb light lyric soprano Elena Talagova, who sang this role to perfection. There was a lot of clean attacks on all the notes. She was able to act this page boy wonderfully, and she was able to make such a great impression as the page boy and manages to really give 110% in terms of this wonderful role. Yes, I do love a little bit of lightness and airiness a la the likes of Roberta Peters, Annalisa Rottenberger, Sylvia Stallman, Rary Grist, and Sumi Jo, and even Anna Christie. But with Elena Talagova, she still was fabulous in this really wonderful character role, and she was able to give her absolute best both vocally and dramatically, making Oscar a very wonderful character to watch on stage from beginning to end. Counts Ribbing and Horn were superbly sung by the bass baritones Andrew Harris and Ben Wager, who combine their plush, cavernous, and well-focused bass baritone voices to such a great level of musicianship, and they complemented each other wonderfully. And we even had some superb performances in the smaller roles, like James Krishik as the judge who sang this role superbly, Robert Watson as Amelia Servant, who also sang this role wonderfully, helped with a very lyrical voice, and of course, John Carpenter as Cristiano, who sang the hell out of this small role. So the singing was really well done, but the singers who stood out to me were without a doubt Jorge de Leon, Elena Taragova, Andrew Harris, and Ben Wager, as they did fabulously in terms of their musicianship. But the overall standout was without a doubt Jorge de Leon, as he was absolutely involved in the drama and was very convincing in terms of his voice. And the conducting done by Donald Runnicles was very well done. One particular highlight was Re del Abiso, in which we have this initial stillness before the audience gets back to their seats. And when the first chord strikes, you can't help but to be taken aback as to what's going to happen as your hair stands on end and you are left glued to your seat. Now that is what I call really setting the atmosphere of what was going to happen in the second act. So overall, the production was decent. The singing was also very decent with the major standout being Jorge de Leon and the conducting done by Donald Runnicles was superb. Well, that's all for now. Be sure to tune in later for my review of Mozart's Cosi Fantute at the Deutsche Oper Berlin. So until then, have a great day, everybody.